Uh, today, uh, Professor Arkani Hamed will give a second lectures. So please start. All righty. Well, um, uh, last time we really had a long introduction and set of motivations for uh, a different picture for thinking about um, uh, scattering amplitudes. Um, and as I, I, prom I promise you that we have some self-contained vignettes today um, about the various aspects of this sort of different picture uh, for how to conceptualize uh, elementary particle scattering. And so I want to begin with um, uh, a first invitation for how, from a very simple minded point of view, uh, an experimentalist uh, might discover that there is something deeper, uh, there's some kind of combinatorial geometry associated with the basic physics of particle scattering. And to begin with, we're going to talk about the uh, very simplest possible theory of uh, scalars. Um, uh, so imagine that we have uh, 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 that that really what's going on is that we have a theory um, which is like a theory with cubic interactions. Um, I'll, I'll define what this is more precisely in a little bit, but imagine it's just a theory that has uh, that has uh, uh, a fundamental three point interactions. Um, and and we're only going to to begin with, we're only going to talk about things at tree level. Um, but uh, 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 we're also going to imagine that we're only drawing diagrams that where the particles are ordered going around um, uh, going around a circle uh, uh, at infinity. So they're ordered one, two, three, four, up to n. And we're only drawing planar diagrams. This is all just for simplicity to begin with. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you what's going on very generally uh, um, uh, a little bit later. So for example, for four-point scattering, we just have the sum of these two diagrams. For a six-point scattering, we'd have diagrams that look like this and diagrams that look like that and a number of uh, each kind. Now, first, a little bit of uh, kinematics. Um, you can see what kind of poles can show up in these. Um, uh, remember, we're, we're going to care a lot about the singularities and the poles of these uh, amplitudes. So what kind of poles can show up? For example, in this diagram, the pole can look like P1 plus P2 squared, which is the same as P3 plus P4 squared or P2 plus P3 squared, which is the same as uh, P1 plus P4 squared, just by conservation of uh, momentum. And uh, in this diagram, in this line, for example, could be P1 plus P2 squared. In this line, it could be P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared, or again, the other way around, P4 plus P5 plus P6 squared. In general, the only poles that we can have are a sum of momenta that are consecutive. So as you see in these examples, you start from some pi plus pi plus one dot dot up to some pj minus one squared minus m squared if the particles have some mass m. Now it's very convenient to actually think about uh, these, uh, these functions in the following way. Since we have the um, conservation of momentum, imagine drawing each momentum end to end on, uh, 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 on, in, on some higher dimensional piece of paper. Um, the fact that you have momentum conservation just tells you that the sum of these momenta add up to zero. So that tells you that they form a closed polygon. And if you draw this closed polygon, then if I look at the distance squared between any two points on this polygon, like here between one and four, see that distance squared is equal to either P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared, or alternately P4 plus P5 plus P6 squared. So exactly the poles that we see in these diagrams precisely correspond to chords on this polygon. Okay, so um, now notice that, that P1 squared itself is just completely determined by the on-shell condition, P1 squared equals M squared. So the, the, so, so, the, so the chords that would look like X12, X23, X34, the ones that are just on the boundary, those aren't really variables. They're just completely locked by the on-shell conditions. But the, but the other chords, that cut through the polygon, those are the actual poles that show up, okay? So those are our kinematic variables. That's what the amplitude actually depends on. And it's very easy to show that actually, uh, that, that, that these xij are in fact a basis of all the independent dot products that you can build out of all these momentum. So not only are they useful for thinking about these planar diagrams are also a basis of all the possible dot products that, that, that uh, you could imagine uh, having anyway. All right, so, so the variables are associated with these, um, uh, with these uh, chords, so uh, keep that in mind. Now imagine that there's an experimentalist that however, that doesn't know that this is the theory that's going on. 
They just have access to these particles. They produce them. They have fingers on their kinematic dial and they move the kinematics around and they want to make some measurements so uh, and see what's going on with the system. So what do you think the first thing they would notice is? The first thing they would probably notice is that as they move these kinematics and uh, data around, as they move these uh, uh, the momenta around or the these X's around, they would notice that sometimes the amplitude blows up, okay? And, um, and so that's clearly something very important. And uh, so clearly the, the experimentalist has to pay attention to what's going on when it blows up. And um, what they pay attention to depends on the kind of experimentalist they are. And anyone who knows experimental particle physicists knows that there are two kinds. There are ones who really are wanna be closet theorists uh, and there are those who really hate theorists. They really want to get, they, they want to ignore theorists as much as possible, okay? So the experimentalist who kind of loves theorists, who secretly wants to be a theorist, um, says, oh, wow, there's a pole here. So I better do very detailed measurements of what's going on in the neighborhood of the pole because I know the poles are important and residues are important and complex analysis, Cauchy's theorem, residues, these are all very important things. So I'm going to look in, in great detail in the neighborhood of what, the, what this uh, thing does uh, uh, in the neighborhood of it blowing up, and they discover that, wow, uh, the coefficient of how it blows up actually is the product of the, the lower amplitudes that they've measured for lower number of particles. So in other words, they discover a factorization, and they think this is the most important thing there is about this process. Uh, so they go to their conference in this uh, imaginary world, and they announce that they've discovered the system and has the properties as they move these uh, kinematics around, sometimes the amplitude blows up, and when it blows up, it factorizes. Now, there's some theorists in the audience who are paying attention to this talk and, uh, and uh, taking this fact of factorization, they can react to it in different ways as a clue to what's going on. So this is clearly a powerful clue to what's going on. One of the theorists in the audience is named Feynman and says, oh, I know what's going on. Um, what's going on is that, uh, there, that, that uh, these amplitudes are the sum over Feynman diagrams that I'm just uh, naming after me. Um, and we are summing over all these virtual particles in the middle, all the possible ways that, that it can happen. And this picture makes it manifest that there are poles in the correct spot and that they factorize on the poles. So that's one uh, reaction is that this fact of factorization could be interpreted as our picture of a conventional picture of particles in space time. There's another theorist in the audience who may be less known to physicists, but would be more known to mathematicians, one of the great mathematicians of the second half of the 20th century, uh, my colleague at the Institute, Pierre Deligne. Uh, Deligne could be sitting in the audience and say, oh, no, 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 I don't know what Feynman's talking about. I've seen exactly the structure before. I've seen the structure that you have some space, and as you go to the boundaries of the space, it splits into two other spaces of the same type. And in fact, it's the very first thing that happens when you study the configuration space of points on, on the projective line. Or equivalently, if you study a configuration of points, let's say five points on the boundary of a circle, then if you take these points up to uh, SL2 transformations, up to Mobius uh, transformations, then, uh, then this space of points also has the property that as you go to its boundaries where some of these points collide, in fact, the space divides in two in precisely the same way. There's the, the so-called bubbling picture. And so that must be what's going on. Whatever's going on with this experimental, it's had something to do with this uh, space of uh, five points on the boundary of a, a disk. Now, this, in fact, is the basis of the picture of string theory. Okay, so, uh, so this very basic mathematical fact about the configuration space of endpoints on the boundary of a disk is precisely how in string theory, all the singularities of amplitudes come about. Okay, so the first picture, uh, what, what I'm trying to emphasize in this slide is that if factorization is the star of your way of thinking about things, it either suggests the picture of particles in space time or of the string world sheet. And these are the two sort of central ways that we know of of, um, of uh, thinking about uh, particle scattering for the past uh, 70 years. However, the hero of my story is someone else. The hero of my story is a lazy uh, and smart experimentalist who instead says, okay, look, I don't wanna do any detailed measurements. Um, this is the experimentalist that kind of hates theorists. Um, I don't wanna do any detailed measurements. Instead, I'm excited by the fact that the amplitude blows up and having made it blow it up, I wanna see if I can make it blow up more. So for instance, they would notice at four points that it blows up when P1 plus P2 squared goes to M squared. 
But then having done that, I can't make it blow up any further, okay? Or I can send P2 plus P3 squared to go to M squared, but having done that, I can't make it blow up any further. On the other hand, if they go to five particles, they would discover that there is some interesting pattern. They can make it blow up more, that uh, they can make P1 plus P2 squared goes to M squared. But then having done that, they can also make P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared goes to M squared as well. And that would make it blow up more. So, uh, so said more mathematically, there's a single pole and the, there's a double pole uh, when both of these things can, can go to zero. But I can't, uh, but there is no pole, there's, uh, but they, I can't put them together willy nilly. There is no pole when P1 plus P2 squared goes to M squared. But for example, P2 plus P3 plus P4 squared goes to M squared. Now, secretly, we understand where these come from if we are thinking that they come from summing Feynman diagrams, simply because, for example, why, don't, why can't I have this? It's because there are simply no diagrams that I can possibly draw that both have a singularity uh, in the S channel when P1 plus P2 squared goes to M squared and in the T channel when P2 plus P3 squared goes to M squared. Similarly, there are simply no diagrams. There's no local processes in space time that can have these so-called incompatible singularities where P1 plus P2 squared goes to M squared, but also P2 plus P3 plus P4 squared goes to M squared, okay? So if I say this in the language of the, uh, using these nice variables that I talked about in the language of this polygon, in this case, um, uh, P1 plus P2 squared would correspond to this purple chord. P2 plus P3 squared would correspond to the blue chord. So you see that I can have the purple chord singularity or the blue chord singularity, but not both of them. If I go to five points, I could have this blue chord singularity, that would be P1 plus P2 squared, and this uh, uh, purple chord, which would be P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared, but, uh, and I can have both of them, but I can't have P1 plus P2 squared and P2 plus P3 squared, for example. And, uh, and, uh, and the reason for that is seen by the fact that these two chords uh, cross. So the chords that don't cross correspond to uh, uh, are allowed to take place together, but the ones that do cross are forbidden. And in fact, uh, this lets us uh, encapsulate the rules of locality and unitarity in a very simple way on, uh, uh, in this uh, graphical way. Um, locality tells us if I look at the maximal set of chords that are allowed, those are all the singularities, the most singular configuration I can have should correspond to uh, non-overlapping chords. So if I have as many of them as I can, I get a bunch of non-overlapping chords and that gives me a triangulation of the uh, polygon. But uh, if there are chords that are overlapping, uh, those correspond to uh, uh, having poles that cannot both be drawn uh, in, in, in any local diagram. Okay, so locality is uh, telling us that crossing chords are not allowed that the only kind of poles that we have uh, should correspond to non-crossing chords. What about unitarity? Well, unitarity is also something, uh, we know that it's factorization. And what is factorization? Very naturally in this picture of the polygon, we are associating some amplitude with the whole polygon. And if a given xij goes to zero, the coefficient of the divergence, which is one over xij, should be the product of the amplitude that you get just by cutting this surface in two along ij. Okay, so that would be the amplitude on the left and the amplitude on the right. Okay, so locality is the pattern of, uh, of poles that are allowed is non-crossing chords. And unitarity is that on the locus of a given one of these xij's going to zero, we have to essentially split the polygon in two and get as the residue of the pole, the product of the two uh, uh, guts. Now, uh, this lazy experimentalist might notice these interesting patterns for how the poles can come together. And, the, and in preparing their uh, data to present at their conference, they would notice that they could actually present the data in a very sort of striking, uh, in a very striking way. That the pattern of how the poles can come together actually is captured by a shape. Now, let me draw that shape for the case of n equals five uh, point scattering that we just talked about. So remember, you're allowed to have like one pole. Here's one pole that corresponds to some um, that, that 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 corresponds to just one of these chords. But what other uh, uh, what other poles can I have? Well, I, I just have to draw a chord that doesn't cross this one. So this is one possibility, and this is another possibility. Uh, and so you see that I can keep going around, um, and I can draw this interesting picture where I imagine that the edges of this picture correspond to a single chord, OK? 
Okay, so there I've drawn it. The vertices correspond to two chords going together. So one pole is the vertices. Two poles, the maximum number of poles in this case is, are, uh, sorry, are the edges. Two poles, the maximum number are the vertices. And so it's slightly interesting that you can actually encapsulate the entire pattern of how the poles can come together in this shape. You can think of the interior of the shape as just being no chords at all. So we can put up to two chords to zero um, in this case. So it's a two dimensional shape. The interior is nothing. The first boundaries, the edges are one pole and the vertices are two poles. And what's remarkable is that you can associate um, uh, this picture with the pattern of non-crossing chords uh, uh, that you can draw on this uh, pentagon. It's completely coincidental that it looks like a pentagon again. Here, we'll see a more complicated example in a moment. If I go back to four point scattering, um, uh, the interior would just be no poles at all. And I just have an interval. On one end, I would have one triangulation. On the other end, I'd have this, I'd have one chord. On the other end, I'd have uh, uh, the other chord. Okay, so now let's say that this experimentalist might wonder if it's actually true that there's always a shape associated with it. And already for the case of six points, you see, if you have six points, we can have up to three propagators. Um, and so it would have to be a three dimensional shape. And uh, I, I'll skip this uh, slide, um, uh, but with some work, uh, you can actually see, and this is much more non-trivial, that in fact, uh, all the pattern of the way the poles can come together, even at six points, can be captured in this remarkable shape. So this shape uh, as a name, um, it's uh, called the Stashev polytope or the isosahedron. And let me uh, explain a little bit about this. So again, uh, what I, I haven't drawn every, uh, uh, everything here, but I've drawn some uh, representative things. Uh, this is a shape where every facet corresponds to, so all the two dimensional faces correspond to um, uh, a just one chord on this hexagon. Remember, we're at n equals six, so we have a hexagon now. All the edges correspond to two chords or two poles. All the vertices correspond to three chords. Okay, and the whole point is that there is a way of assigning these. Uh, so we can think about every facet of any dimensionality as some partial triangulation of this hexagon, uh, where I have some of the chords that are non non crossing. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and lower dimensional uh, faces of a given face correspond to finer triangulations that are compatible with the coarser one. Okay, so for example, here I have uh, this face is associated with that chord. This edge, this edge here is associated with uh, something that has both this chord and that one, okay? So, uh, and whereas this guy is, is just this chord, it's just this other one. So where this face and this face meet on this edge, I, I have both of the chords uh, from the right guy and the left guy together associated with that edge. Finally, uh, the, they, uh, this, this meets this and that one at this vertex that has both this chord, that one, as well as this other guy there. And you can fill out all of the rest of this picture consistently. That's a remarkable thing. You can fill it out all consistently such that all the facets are associated with partial triangulations of the uh, hexagon uh, in such a way that, uh, that lower dimensional facets still are finer triangulations, uh, are, 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 are finer, um, uh, one step finer triangulations relative to the uh, triangulation that you associate with the given uh, uh, facet. All right, so that, that's very remarkable. It means that the pattern of how the poles can come together is actually captured by this remarkable shape. If we look at this shape, uh, so again, all the vertices would be are associated with triangulations. Um, you can think of each one of these triangulations as really one of the Feynman diagrams because each one of them has all of the propagators in it of a given Feynman diagram. Okay, so all the vertices are associated with uh, Feynman diagrams. Um, and all of the facets are associated with, uh, with the coarser factorization channels. So you can think of the interior as no factorization, the first face as factorizing one pole, uh, the edges as factorizing uh, twice, and the vertices as factorizing all the way, which just gets me down to the actual uh, finding factors. So this is a remarkable fact, which is not obvious 
um, from the standard picture. I mean, it's not obvious. You see, uh, this first experimentalist didn't notice this fact. This first experimentalist just noticed factorization, and that's it. Uh, Feynman and Deline did not know that this very simple basic fact that the second experimentalist discovered that the pattern of how the poles come together is captured by this uh, uh, remarkable shape. But in fact, this shape knows everything that Feynman and Deline knew. The shape knows all about factorization. And that's because of the following uh, beautiful thing. If you look at the faces of this isosahedron, if you look at it carefully, you see that there are six faces that look like pentagons and three that look like squares. Okay, so if I take one of the faces that looks like a pentagon, um, uh, the, the claim is that all the faces actually look exactly like the direct products of lower uh, polytopes of the same type, of lower isosahedra, in a way that precisely reflects factorization. For example, this face, um, uh, which is a pentagon, remember, we already saw the five-point scattering, the picture looks like a pentagon. So, so uh, we, we interpret this face as actually being the direct product of a five-point, the shape for a five-point process and the shape for a three-point process. And remember, the shape for a three-point process will be zero-dimensional. There are no propagators, so that's just the point in this simple case. Okay, so these pentagons correspond to a factorization of five-point times three-point. What about the squares? You see, there are three factorization channels where you have three, four part, uh, three particles on one side with one intermediate one. So there's a four particle on one side and a four particle on the other side. And remember, the four particle shapes were just an interval. The four particle shapes are just an, an interval. And indeed, the direct product of an interval times an interval gives you a square, right? So you see, this shape knows something. It knows also about factorization. From the shape, you see that when you go to the faces of the shape, the faces are not new things. The faces are just given by direct products of, of the older, of the smaller, uh, uh, of, of the polytopes associated with smaller n in a way that precisely reflects uh, factorization. All right, so here I've drawn the uh, picture again. At this time, I've, I've decorated them with literally sort of Feynman diagrams, so you have an uh, idea of what it, what it looks like. Once again, uh, you can keep on going and associate all of the edges and all the faces of this picture with partial factorization. So a face would, uh, this face would be uh, four particles on one side, one intermediate, one intermediate and two on the outside. And the, the, the edges would be to further factorize. So you see sort of two propagators and when you factorize all the way, uh, you just get the, uh, the, the, the cubic graphs of the uh, Feynman diagrams, okay? So this is a remarkable fact. This is a remarkable fact that our second experimentalist notices. It's a very basic fact about the pattern of how the singularities come together. The singularities come together in a very particular way that reflects both locality and unitarity that's just packaged into the fact that they, they form this interesting uh, polytope. The particle and the string picture do not make this fact obvious. And that's why it's not in all the textbooks. However, the polytope knows everything. I'm just stressing this again, because um, not only do we see that, that, well, there is a polytope, but that it has a remarkable property that it's facets of the direct product of objects of the same type at lower end. And so that's, uh, as I said, this is the first invitation. So this is something that we're going to try to make obvious in, in, uh, in the rest of this talk. Now, uh, a number of years ago, uh, around back in 2017 with some uh, colleagues, we actually found a very specific realization of, the, of this isosahedron, um, which looks like this. So here I've labeled the faces with the poles that, uh, that uh, uh, we would see associated with each one of the face, just labeling in different ways. Um, and so, uh, so if you look carefully, you see that, 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 the, that, the, that the structure of the facet is, is exactly the same. Um, it has six pentagons, three uh, square-like faces. They meet in exactly the same way as this picture, but it's drawn in a very specific way with a very specific shape. And, uh, and we sort of stumbled into this by some accident and some guesswork, uh, but it had some uh, number of uh, remarkable properties. And so uh, we'd like to understand not just where this, uh, this sort of shape comes from, but also where this very specific version of the shape um, that, that, that the uh, mathematicians are now, uh, uh, some mathematicians now refer to as the ABHY uh, isosahedra 
um, uh, after the, the paper where this was first proposed back in 2017. We'd like to understand where this comes from, not from the sort of uh, physicist guesswork where we got it to begin with, but from uh, somewhere else. All right, now, uh, this is still the context of the invitation, but I want to tell you that there is even a few other things uh, going on. Um, that even these tree amplitudes for these dumb uh, uh, phi cube theories actually have a hidden symmetry. And uh, let me tell you what the hidden symmetry is. So uh, in order to see the asymmetry, we're actually going to talk to begin with, not about uh, the amplitude, but about something else which is very closely related, a certain differential form that we'd write down instead of the amplitude. So uh, let's say that uh, I take these two diagrams for four points. Naively, we would write down one over S plus one over T, or maybe a one over x13 plus one over x24, uh, corresponding to these uh, to the poles that we see. But instead, I'm going to invite you to write down a differential form instead. So instead of one over x13, I'm going to write down dx13 over x13. Instead of one over x24, I'm going to write down dx24 over x24. If you remember the qualitative things I told you about positive geometries uh, in the last lecture, it's important to talk about these forms that have logarithmic singularities. Um, and so we're going to talk about these forms for a moment. We're going to talk about these forms instead of the amplitude. We'll come back to the amplitude in just a second. Um, but so instead of imagine your summing diagrams to begin with, that instead of uh, instead of just making functions, we're going to make a form. Everywhere we have a one over x, we replace it with a dx over x. But now uh, I'm going to claim that there's an important sign here, and that uh, I need to put a minus sign here and not a plus sign. And the motivation for putting the minus sign here is that if you have the minus sign, then this form is actually uh, not just a function of the overall scales of x13 and x24, but is the function of just the ratios of x13 and x24. Okay, so if you put a minus sign here, this is the same as a d log of the ratio of x13 over x24. That would not be true if you put a, a plus sign. And for general n, uh, the motivation is to write down a form which is invariant under a general rescaling of all of the x's. I can make it a, a, a rescaling by any function of the x's that I like. What I want is that this form is only a function of ratios of the x's. And if I do that, that puts a horrendous constraint. Uh, you see, at four points, I could just solve it automatically by choosing a sign, but you can check that uh, if you ask for this to be true at higher n, um, uh, you have many, many, many more equations that have to be satisfied than the number of signs that you can pick. So it, at first, it seems like it's impossible. There's no way to choose signs so that everything is actually consistent. But amazingly, even though there are many more equations than unknowns, it turns out that the signs can always be chosen in such a way that this form enjoys this hidden symmetry of uh, projective invariance. So we call the symmetry projective invariance. And again, notice that as, as in this example, every Feynman diagram by itself breaks the symmetry. Only the sum over all the Feynman diagrams together with these magically chosen signs, which are highly non-trivial that one set of signs make it work for everything. Um, uh, uh, only the sum over all the diagrams with the correct signs guarantees that, uh, that the answer has the symmetry. Every diagram by itself breaks it, only the sum over all of them uh, has it. This is the hidden symmetry of even this dumb uh, scalar theory. And um, it's an analog of a much fancier hidden symmetry, if those of you who know about this, in uh, N equals four super Yang Mills known as dual conformal invariance. This in a quite precise sense is an analog of dual conformal invariance, even for this very simple uh, scalar theory. Now that's for the amplitude. Uh, another little bit of magic is that uh, once you have this differential form, you say, okay, I don't care about this form. How do I get actually the amplitude? So let's say I'm talking about the, uh, the case of four point scattering again. So I have this form that looked like dx13 over x13 minus dx24 over x24. How, do I, how can I get the amplitude? Well, how do I get a, a function uh, out of a form? Well, I could take this form, this one form, it lives in a two dimensional space of x13 and x24. But I can take this one form and I can pull it back. I can just evaluate it on a simple subspace. So here's a very simple subspace where x13 plus x24 equals a constant. Okay, so I'm just going to evaluate this form along this line. And if you evaluate this form, this form, uh, dx13 over x13 minus dx24 over x24 on this line, you find that you pull out just the overall volume form on this line, dx13. But now the signs go away. And what I get is just the amplitude. 
Okay, and this also turns out to be true in general. But there's a there's a some plane that you can pull back this form with all these intelligent signs on it. That when you pull back that form on this plane, you discover after you pull off the overall volume form that what you're multiplying is the actual amplitude. All the signs go away, and what you're multiplying is the amplitude. The fact that the form had this hidden symmetry actually tells you something hidden about the amplitude. I don't have time to describe it in detail, but it tells you that there are directions that you can go to infinity in momentum where the amplitude dies more quickly than you would naively think from looking at Feynman diagrams. So there's some cancellation between all the diagrams such that in certain directions as you go out, the amplitude dies more quickly than you would naively think. And that is a hidden fact about the amplitude that's uh, extremely useful. Um, it turns out that uh, making that fact manifest gives rise to new formulas, even for these very simple scalar theories that are vastly more efficient than uh, Feynman diagrams. Um, they're the most efficient known formulas for these, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, amplitudes. Um, I'm not gonna talk anything about the sort of details of what those formulas look like. I'm gonna focus more on the sort of conceptual points about this uh, geometry. But uh, the fact that there's this hidden symmetry has real consequences. Um, for, uh, for, for seeing uh, hidden simplicity in the answer, even in this very simple scalar theory. And it's very striking that the hidden simplicity has something to do with a better than behavior expected of the theory at infinite momentum. Okay, so um, uh, that was it for the uh, uh, invitation. Um, maybe I can uh, pause for a moment and see if there are any questions before we move on to the next, um, uh, to start talking about these things in a little bit more detail. Any questions about all of that? Hello. Uh, hi. Just in the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so when you uh, make this uh, projection into a subspace, is there yeah. any rule why it's uh, x1 Absolutely. Yes. I, I should, should, that, 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 that's right. That's right. So uh, I'm going to show you where all these things come from. Uh, these were all just sort of observations. So that's why so this is just an invitation. And uh, as, as, as I said, um, I'm, I'm attempting to give you a bunch of self-contained vignettes. So here, they're just sort of observations. They're all sort of come out of the blue. In the next part, I'm gonna try to give some systematics for where these things actually come from. Okay. Hello, I have one question. Yeah. So in this kind of argument, uh, uh, it seems to me that the, uh, the, you are, the propagator is uh, propagator and the energy momentum conservation makes a very, uh, crucial role. And when we define field theory, for example, for the scalar field theory, you, you can have a phi to the cube theory, phi to the fourth theory, or yes. even uh, Goldstone boson, like, pion, like a non yes, yes. Sigma model, etc. Right. Right. So, which have all different vertices yes. in the field so, theory so, language. So, right. so what, and, uh, the, the, the structure that I'm talking about in this mm. talk, but since I'm focusing on something like phi cubed, if, if you like, first I'm talking about just these sort of, uh, strictly speaking, I'm only talking about these uh, by cube like uh, theories, but um, uh, but what it's capturing, what's universal about by cube is the structure of the denominators, okay? All the, all the propagators and the poles. On top of that, there's something about the structure of the numerators and different theories will have different numerators. And, uh, and that's something which is, you know, really just starting to be explored how to think about the geometry associated with the numerators, if you like. But most of the things that have been going on are in theories where, uh, where, which are essentially controlled by what the structure of the singularities of the propagators look like. In the very simple example I'm talking about in these talks, it's really just about the scalar phi cube like theory. In the story of Yang Mills theory and supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, of course, in the Feynman diagram language, we have vertices, momenta, all sorts of things in the numerators. But, uh, but it turns out that the physics is essentially fixed by giving the structure of the denominator. Um, so, so for theories where the, or another way of saying it, where the, where the basic interactions are three-point interactions. So the basic interactions in yang Mills theory and this phi-cube theory are three-point interactions. And then when that's the case, you can completely determine the uh, theory from these geometric considerations that I, of the sort that I'm talking about in these talks. More generally, more general theories where there's more kinds of amplitude to determine them. For example, we can have contact four-point amplitudes if we have a five to the four interaction and so on. You need to now talk about more. Uh, you need to talk about what the structure of the numerators are as well. Um, so I'm not talking about that 
in these talks. That's somehow associated. You see, once you have numerators, you also have singularities that at infinite momentum, not just at, uh, uh, at uh, when you particles go on shell, but you can also have interesting right, singularities right. at uh, infinity. And so there's very likely some kind of geometry associated with singularities at infinity as well. But what we're seeing so far is just the geometry that it's associated in this hidden way with the singularities of the far infrared. Hmm. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Um, yeah, this yeah. is a stupid question. Is there relative geometry as opposed to positive geometry? Yeah, sorry, well, it, it, uh, it's your question. Is there a negative geometry as, a, yeah. uh, as opposed to positive geometry? Yeah. Actually, I mean, uh, it's a, sometimes a bit of a definitional thing, um, but, uh, but, but in some very recent work, we, we, we've been finding with some friends that um, having geometries where some conditions are negative and some are positive is actually very, very important. So you can also have quote unquote negative geometries, but, mm -hmm. but, but it, it's a bit of a linguistic thing. What, what, what really matters is that you have a bunch of inequalities that are carving out some, some space. Whether you write those inequalities as X bigger than zero or negative X less than zero doesn't really matter all that much. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions before we um, uh, proceed? Uh, one naive question: What is what's, what is fixing the length and the angles in your uh, amplitudons? Uh, uh, you mean in this picture? In in this picture here? In this picture versus yeah. the picture you were draw, drawing. That's right. On... This, 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 this picture, nothing. This, this, this picture is uh, essentially completely combinatorial. Okay. okay. Um, it's just about who talks to who. Um, uh, this picture is very specific. You see that there are, I mean, if you look at it in detail, there are some sides that are parallel to each other. They're, they're, this is a very specific picture. And I'm now going to tell you where this picture comes from. Okay, okay. so. Um, there okay. is one question in the chatting window. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me see if uh, I don't see it. Uh, let me, oops. What was the question? Um, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, uh, polygonal diagonals can't cross. Is this because the residue of one reaction cannot partially contain the information of other reaction, which uh, um, hinders uh, an amplitude uh, satisfying self-consistent factorization? Um, th there, of course, related to uh, uh, each other, but uh, I would say, and by the way, this is sort of one example of how close locality and unitarity are to each other. But it's really locality that says that you cannot have, uh, the. it's really locality that says that you can't have crossing chords. If you have, you see, if you take any one of these pictures with the non-crossing chords, there's a picture of propagators, which look like things hitting each other and local, local propagators. In fact, if you take, the triangulation of a polygon and just take the jewel of the picture, you literally get a Feynman diagram. But if the chords cross, you can't do it. So there isn't even a local picture that you can draw. Once that's the case, once that's the case that the only local pictures correspond to non-crossing chords, then of course it's very natural. What could it possibly mean when you cross a chord? Uh, well, it could split in two. So somehow locality and unitarity are, are very close to each other uh, to a begin with. They're both statements about what happens, uh, statements about uh, chords on this, uh, on this uh, polygon. All right, so- uh, let I me... have a one question. Yes. So, uh, one other question. So I think you assume the, the external line is all the same particle. So what if the external line is different particle then? No, I, I'm not even assuming that, 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 it's not even necessary to assume that they're all the same. The only thing that I'm the only thing that I'm assuming is that I have the sort of these planar diagrams, um, and that there's an ordering. Uh, that is all that I'm uh, that I'm assuming here. The particles can be massive. The particles can be different. Um, uh, it doesn't make any difference. But for example, so the two to two, two sketching, which have different particle is only have S channel, not P channel or U channel, but that doesn't matter in your case, I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, if you like, what, what, I'm, what I'm assuming here is that all these coupling constants are the same, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, that doesn't by itself demand that the particles, are, that the particle masses or anything like that are the same. Okay. 
Yeah, so, so the weights for all these diagrams are, are uh, equal. But certainly, the most natural thing to do would be to assume that they're, that, 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 that they're all the same. Um, there are various things that we could talk about later for how to talk about phi cubed, phi to the four, more general interactions. But for the moment, let's just concentrate on the very sort of simplest, uh, uh, the very simplest story. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, con continue. Um, all right, so, um, okay. So I think uh, I'm now gonna, um, uh, we're now gonna talk about um, the second part. And uh, I think probably what I'll do, instead of trying to rush through things, um, I will really try to explain this second part where these sort of polytopes come from and so on um, uh, in the sort of simplest case. And then I will just tell you some things that are true about how it works in generality at all loop order and so on. Um, and I probably won't have time to explain in detail uh, how this picture generalizes from particles to strings. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll try to say something about it at least uh, impressionistically. But I'm, I, I don't want to rush. I want to at least explain a few things uh, in a totally self-contained way as, as I have promised. So, um, okay, so if you've, if you've fallen asleep, um, this is a good time to wake up again because the second part again is going to be entirely self-contained. Uh, uh, All right, so now, Let's think about what our challenge is. So, um, so uh, what is our sort of kinematic space for this problem? Our kinematic space for this problem, the amplitude, what does it depend on? The amplitude depends on these xijs, right? So that is my space. That's the space uh, in the space of all possible xijs. That's all the data I have. I don't even I don't even access to the momentum directly. The only things that matter are the dot products. I can group the dot products in the xijs if I like. So my data that labels the scattering process are these xijs. That's my space. And in the space of xijs, I somehow have to find a question to ask there whose answer is going to give me the amplitude or the answer is going to discover this isosahedron from which I can find the amplitude via this idea of the canonical form and so on and so forth. OK, so I hope you see what our challenge is. So when I said way back, way back early, that we have to find some new question in the space that defines the scattering process, now you see very concretely what we have to do. Our space is the space of xijs. That's all we have. Uh, somehow in the space of xijs, I have to find a question that is going to bring to life these interesting polytopes uh, and tell me something about the amplitude and so on and so forth. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Okay, so there, so, um, so to begin with, we are going to just do something very simple. We're just going to uh, draw a picture to pictorially represent all of these xijs. And notice that since everything is, is around this polygon and has a natural cyclic symmetry, so what am I going to do? I'm going to begin by writing down x12. Now remember, all of the edges one, two, two, three, three, four, they're all they're they're all equal to zero, let's say, uh, or they're all equal to m squared, where particle is mass m. Let's just say that it's massless, just so I don't have to keep saying m. Uh, it can have any mass, but let's just say that it's massless. So I would write down x12, which happens to be zero. But then it's natural to just uh, to just just you know put the indices down on a grid. So I have x12, x13, x14, x15, x16, and let's say if it's n equals seven scattering, I would end at x17, which is again equal to zero because uh, uh, this is n equals seven. So seven one is the last edge of this sort of uh, heptagon. All right, so to begin with, I'm just going to draw all of these uh, variables. And so you see that I just get this grid. I'm choosing uh, to draw them in this 45 degree way only for a future uh, convenience. But already something kind of cool happens here. Already just this picture of, and so by the way, and I'm uh, recording in black here, the guys on these edges, these are the guys that are equal to zero. They're the ones that are locked. They're just the edges of the polygon. The rest of them are the interior cords of the, uh, the polygon. Well, notice a few uh, interesting things. Um, uh, for instance, uh, if, if I draw a sort of a continuum version of this picture, you see that there's the point one three here and the point three one up there. Now one three and three one are exactly the same core. So we should identify these two points with each other. And if I draw a sort of a continuum version of this and I call this direction that goes up T and this direction X, of course I'm writing them as T and X so that they remind you of time and space. 
um, but uh, but they're just labels for now. Then we have this interesting identification that xt is identified with one minus x and one plus t, which gets identified with xt again up there. Okay, so this is a sort of a Mobius identification on this infinite band. But the really uh, interesting thing about this picture is that once I draw, I'm, I'm simply again all I'm doing is I'm drawing the uh, I'm 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 recording all my variables uh, in this uh, simple way that there's actually a good reason for calling this direction time and this direction space. And uh, uh, to see why, let's go back to our polygon. And remember, there's something very important from our point of view in this polygon. There's something important whether two uh, chords, i, j, and k, l, whether they cross each other or not. And it turns out that in this picture, where I record all my kinematic variables in this strip, um, if, if I write the chord uh, ij, so that's some point on the left here, and kl, that's some point on the left, then quite beautifully, ij intersects kl has a very simple interpretation. ij intersects kl, if and only if, if I look at the future quote-unquote light cone out of ij and the past quote-unquote light cone out of kl. I just mean by light cone, draw 45 degree lines out, uh, out of ij and 45 degree uh, lines out back from kl, then ij intersects kl if and only if uh, the points ij and kl on the left here are the past and future corners of a causal diamond that fits inside this strip. Okay, so that's the reason why this kinematic space, which is just the space of all these xij's, naturally gets this interesting quote unquote space time structure uh, associated with it. Two points that can causally influence each other so that they're the past and the future corners of a causal diamond um, are correspond to uh, chords on the polygon that intersect each other. If the chords don't intersect each other, it means that either those two points are quote unquote space like separated so they can't influence each other, or they're so far separated in time that the cone going out can't intersect the uh, out from the bottom one, can't intersect the cone coming back in time from the top. Okay, so this is a clue for the kind of, you see now we have to look for some kind of theory in this space of X's. What kind of theory are we looking for? Well, a very beginning clue is that once I just start drawing what the X's look like, uh, th there's this interesting kind of uh, uh, causal diamond structure that we should be thinking about. Um, just one more point. Uh, if I want to um, uh, talk about my, my variables so that every variable is kept once, is recorded once and only once, then I have to take a certain chunk out of this um, uh, strip. The easiest thing I'm going to do, which I'll focus on in my, the rest of my pictures, is to take this chunk, this kind of uh, uh, right triangle chunk, and you see that everything here is included once and only once. Here's one, three, one, four, one, five. So one, three is here is included, but three one is outside and is not included. Um, uh, so four seven is here, but seven four is out here and not included. Three five is inside here, but five three is outside somewhere and, and not uh, uh, included. So everything is included once and only once in this picture. I don't have to do it this way. I can do it this way. I can do it uh, many ways, but I'm going to choose this way for convenience for the rest of this uh, talk. All right. So now we're starting to get somewhere. We have our kinematic variables. Uh, we've just drawn them. I'm taking a chunk out of this space in order to uh, talk about it. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down a theory. And my, uh, and my theory is very much motivated by thinking about just the wave equation in this one plus one dimensional quote unquote space time. But let me just state directly uh, what it is. So this is my chunk. So here I've drawn the case of seven point scattering again. Now in red, I've drawn the guys that are equal to zero. So one, two, two, three, three, four, and so on. These boundary guys are zero. I've drawn uh, all the other guys um, uh, in blue. And I'm going to assume that, th that I have variables X, I, J that are associated with all of these guys. But now we're gonna have some interesting notions of positivity appear. I'm going to ask that all of these X, I, J's are positive. But on top of that, I'm going to restrict, I'm going to assume that these xij's satisfy some relations between each other. And the relations are the following, that for every little one of these meshes in this picture, for every little picture like this, for every mesh like this, this mesh has a past, 
a future and a left and a right corner, I'm going to write down this interesting formula that the x plus the past plus the x of the future minus x left minus x right is equal to a constant. Okay, so for every one of these little meshes in this picture, there's going to be a constant. And I'm going to write down this equation for every mesh. Now, this equation is actually quite familiar. This is a lattice form of the wave equation in one plus one dimensions. Indeed, if you imagine making these meshes smaller and smaller, exactly this x, plus, uh, x past plus x future minus x left minus x right, if I call this direction u and this direction v, this just becomes a double derivative du dv. This combination becomes a double derivative du dv. And this is nothing under the wave equation that du dv is equal to a source c on the right hand side. Okay, except I'm writing down the sort of discrete form of this uh, wave equation. Uh, and I'm demanding that this, uh, uh, that the sources are also positive. Okay, so, so this is where I'm making a quote unquote dynamical guess. Okay, now I'm trying to write down the theory here. Um, this is like, uh, to begin with a completely boring space of just xijs, but they're starting to be a little bit of structure. I draw them in this way. I see that they have this interesting sort of causal relationship captures something about the crossing of chords. I see that I have to choose a chunk out of this strip in order to talk about all the variables in a sensible way. And then I'm now, uh, this is my dynamics in this kinematic space is writing down this lattice form of the wave equation. That's it. This is the entire story. And now let's see what uh, happens. Let's see how it works. So let's do the simplest case of uh, four point scattering where there'll just be one point on the inside here. I shoot out my sort of light rays and I just have one mesh. Uh, and now let's write down these, uh, these uh, equations. So my equation would say that x13 plus x24 minus x23 minus x14 is equal to some positive constant. Remember x23 is zero and x14 is zero. So this is just saying that x13 plus x24 is equal to a constant. And remember that I also want the x13 and x24 to be positive. So I can solve for x24 in terms of x13. And so x24 is just c minus x13. And so in x13 space, I've solved for everyone in terms of x13. x13 is positive, but also x24 is positive that says that x13 should be smaller than c. And so in x13 space, you see I have to live inside this little interval. Okay. Let me go to the next case of five point scattering. So I have. Um, I shoot out my, my, uh, uh, my light rays again. I draw this picture. Now I notice I have five variables, one, three, one, four, two, four, two, five, and three, five. And as before, I can solve for two, four, two, five, and three, five in terms of one, three, and one, four. This is again quite familiar if you think of this really as a picture of a wave equation, a discrete form of the wave equation in one plus one dimensions. If you give me the, the data on a null boundary in the past, I can completely solve the wave equation going into the future. Okay, so these are my fundamental equations, x13 plus x24, uh, x13 plus x24 minus x14 minus x23 is a constant. And similarly for uh, the other guys. Now, uh, again, uh, I'm going to solve for x24, x25, and x35 in terms of x13 and x14. And I'm going to ask that everybody is positive. OK, and so for instance, uh, clearly x13 has got to be positive, x14 has got to be positive. So I, if I plot in x13, x14 space, I have to live in the upper quadrant. But on top of that, I'm going to have three more linear inequalities that come from solving for x24 being positive, x25 being positive, and x35 being positive. And if you work it out, you get this interesting shape. Okay, you get something that looks exactly like a pentagon. Right, so that's, that's kind of cool. There didn't seem to be any pentagon in the problem, but we just write down this wave equation. We just write down these positive conditions and, and this uh, pentagon pops out in a fascinating way. Let's keep on going. If we go to uh, six points, now we have uh, a total of nine points on the inside here. So we have one, three, one, four, and one, five. We have these six other points in the interior. And now again, if I plot things in X13, X14, X15 space, uh, everything's got to be positive. So it lives in the upper uh, octant. But on top of that, I have six more conditions coming from X24, 25, 26, 35, 36, and 46, all of them being positive. 
And if you just work it out in exactly the same way we did before, remarkably, you discover this beautiful isosahedron, which was exactly the ADHY isosahedron that I told you about early on. Exactly this shape. Precisely this shape actually is uh, comes out of this um, of this uh, uh, of this picture that in the kinematic space now, in the space that defines the scattering process, um, we ask for positivity of the variables and a certain kind of quote unquote dynamical uh, rule that has to do with something that looks like the wave equation in this space. And this is not an accident. So here I've just shown you what the pictures uh, look like, but really the sort of deep point is that the, the structure of the, the positivity that gives us this polytope actually implies both locality and unitarity. Both locality and unitarity come out of these very, very simple rules. So let's see how locality comes about. Remember, um, uh, uh, locality is uh, interpreted as the, as the fact that, um, uh, that I can't have crossing chords. In the language of the polytope, that means that if you have a face that corresponds to one chord and a face that corresponds to another chord, if the chords cross, those faces cannot meet each other. The only way the faces can meet is if they're compatible with each other. So uh, if, the, if the chords cross, those faces cannot both meet. And what that means is that if you set, if you go to the face corresponding to one variable equals zero, uh, then uh, if you have another variable that corresponds to a crossing chord, I cannot put that to zero at the same time. Um, if I could put them to zero at the same time, they would be meeting on a, on a lower dimensional face. So, uh, so if I have two variables that are incompatible, two chords that are incompatible, I cannot set the x's for both of them equal to zero at the same time. And let's see why that is. Well, that's just a trivial uh, consequence of the rules of positivity. Remember our wave equation said that x past plus x future minus x left minus x right is equal uh, to a constant. And if you take that for these little meshes, uh, it's trivial to see that, uh, that um, and this is the analog of going from the differential to the integral form of Gauss's law, that if you actually take any points any causal diamond, not necessarily one of the small meshes, but any diamond, the same formula is true. That x past plus x future minus x left minus x right is the total charge, the sum of all these little mesh constants for all the meshes inside. You can think of the, the, the uh, total charge. So, so, uh, so for any two points, uh, we have that x past plus x future minus x left minus x right is the sum over all these uh, Cs, which is positive. And so I can't set, if I set x past to zero, then if the past and the future or the past are, are indeed the past and future corners of some causal diamond, uh, then I can't set both of these equal to zero because then uh, I would have zero plus zero minus two positive things, uh, minus two positive things is equal to something positive, which is impossible. So you see that in this very simple way, the assumption of positivity guarantees locality. It guarantees that uh, that that chords that uh, that the facets that correspond to crossing chords cannot meet each other. And it's a two-line argument that I don't have time to uh, explain in a detail yet. That that this picture also explains unitarity. This picture also tells you that if you actually go on a facet, so uh, so if going to the boundary means that x it should be generically positive everywhere. But let's say you go to an extreme and you set x equal to zero somewhere on the inside, then you discover from a two-line argument that 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 what the geometry looks like is actually the direct product of two smaller geometries associated with smaller triangles, in exactly the way that reflects the factorization that we talked about way way back here uh, in the uh, as a as a statement about the um, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the apolytope that the facets are direct products of lower polytopes in exactly the same form. So that's what we've uh, seen from this picture, that this very simple structure in kinematic space explains now everything. It explains why we have why the pattern of poles is captured by polytope, why we have factorization, which tells us why we have locality, why crossing chords can't meet, and why we have factorization, why the boundaries of this polytope factorize into the product of simpler things. Okay, so this sees sort of all the qualitative features of the amplitude um, and more than just the factorization, which is what the first experimentalist in Feynman and Deleen uh, knew about. Now, that was all about the geometry. I'll just say a few words about how we actually get uh, uh, the amplitude. So again, 
uh, this is a this is a polytope, and the scattering amplitude is really directly associated with one of these canonical forms that I told you about, associated with positive geometries. There's a unique form that lives on all of this kinematic space, which has the property that when you pull it back to a subspace, um, and, and what determines that subspace are exactly these linear conditions that give us the wave equation. Um, uh, this form that lives on the entire kinematic space when pulled back on the solution of the wave equation uh, gives us the uh, canonical form for the corresponding isosahedron. So that's the answer to Young Do's question. How do we know what the spaces that we pull back to? The space that we pull back to is the one that satisfies this wave equation in the uh, kinematic space. Okay? And um, once you know that, uh, uh, if you want to get the canonical form for this polytope, uh, there's there's a number of um, uh, there's a number of strategies for getting canonical forms for positive geometries, but one of them is to build it by triangulation. So if you have a sort of complicated shape, you can triangulate it into simpler ones, and um, and uh, and the canonical form for the simpler ones is very easy to get, as we saw very early on uh, when we talked about the canonical forms of triangles, for example. They were extremely simple. Well, the, the canonical form for triangles and simplices are very simple. So if you can triangulate your positive geometry into sums of simplices in some appropriate way, then uh, that can give you a formula for the uh, canonical form. And anyway, uh, I won't go through this in, uh, in uh, detail, but it turns out that there's a very standard way of thinking about uh, triangulating a, uh, a, a polygon or uh, triangulating a polytope. And uh, this is what the uh, technique is. Let me just illustrate it. It looks maybe a, a little odd to uh, begin with, um, but let's say you want to triangulate this square. Okay? If you want to triangulate this square, well, maybe the most obvious thing you would do is put a line in the middle of the square. Okay, but that involves making a choice, whether to put it here or put it there. There's another way that involves sort of uh, uh, fewer choices or a different kind of choice, which is you do the following. Uh, you take the square and then you add some line far away. You call it a line at infinity. You just add a line somewhere outside the square. And then from every vertex, you, you continue the lines that pass through that vertex until they hit this, uh, also this line at infinity. So out of two, you'd make this big triangle. Out of one, you'd make this littler triangle. Out of three, you'd make this little triangle. Out of four, you'd make the smallest triangle. And you can see that this little square is actually given by this big triangle minus this little triangle minus this other little triangle. And oops, I over subtracted this even littlest triangle. So I add that littlest triangle back in. So there's some way, uh, so there's this canonical way of getting a triangulation of the shape by adding something at infinity and just making very simple simplices by continuing all of the all of the planes that meet at that vertex. Okay, this is a technique for triangulating any polytope, and it turns out that when you apply this technique for this isosahedron that we discovered in this way, remember all the vertices of the isosahedron are associated with complete triangulations of the polygon, or otherwise with Feynman diagrams. So the vertices are associated with Feynman diagrams. And this triangulation of the isosahedron has a name. It's known as a sum over Feynman diagrams. Okay? So one triangulation of the isosahedron returns the standard way of thinking about this physics as the sum over Feynman diagrams. But you'll notice that it's a rather artificial one. You introduce this funny plane far away. And that means that every single piece Every single term, every diagram has an artificial singularity on this line at infinity that cancels out only when you add everything up. That's the projective invariance of the hidden projective invariance of the form that I was telling you about. It's exactly the fact that the dependence on this line at infinity actually cancels out when you add everything up, but that's not made obvious term by term in the Feynman diagrams. And it turns out that there are many other triangulations of the isosahedron as well. Um, many of them which manifest as projective invariants term by term, and these actually gives you formulas that are vastly more efficient than the Feynman diagrams. I mean, literally, you can compute on a laptop some 30-point amplitude, uh, and there would be gazillions of Feynman diagrams that would go on for days uh, for doing it from the standard point of view. You get the answer in seconds. Okay, so it really makes uh, it makes it, it really it, it's actually practically uh, useful uh, as well. And there's actually other realizations of this um, geometry as well, uh, which are associated not just with the picture of particle scattering, but with the generalizing from particles to a string. 
Um, so let me stop here and ask if there are any questions um, uh, about this before I say a few other things and, and start uh, wrapping up. No? Okay. All right, so, um, so, uh, so um, in, in the next, uh, so I, I'm gonna begin uh, uh, wrapping up, but I just wanna give you some impressions of what the, um, of what the most general story is actually uh, like, like here. Okay, so, um, so what we're really doing is talking about uh, uh, the amplitudes of a trace phi cube theory. Okay, so uh, now I'm being more, more, more specific. So um, you imagine that you have a scalar field, which is really an N by N matrix, and the Lagrangian is like a, uh, as a free uh, kinetic term, trace d phi dagger d phi, and some interaction that looks like G trace phi cube. And so we have the usual picture of the sort of a took double line notation, and all the Feynman diagrams are associated with, um, uh, all the Feynman diagrams are associated with surfaces in the, in the standard way that we're used to in thinking about the large N expansion. Okay, so the, the usual tough uh, large N uh, topological uh, GS expansion. Okay, so let me skip these uh, slides. Um, uh, but for instance, let's say I wanted to talk about uh, one loop diagrams. So um, maybe I can, uh, in case this wasn't clear before, let me just, um, uh, uh, let me just write something down. Uh, hold on one moment. Um, sorry. Whoops, oh, I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, let me just uh, uh, explain uh, something in, in more detail. So um, uh, remember, uh, we were talking about, uh, for example, at four points, we said we have diagrams that look like this and diagrams that look like that. Um, but uh, I can also think about, about this as follows. Uh, I can also think about um, taking my square and, uh, and thinking about uh, this triangulation of the square or this triangulation of the square. And in fact, these pictures are related to each other. If you draw the dual of this diagram, so the dual would be, to, would be that uh, I, I, I imagine putting a, a dot in the middle of each face and also on the outside, and I draw the, the dual, you see that the, the, uh, the, the dual of this triangulation is exactly that Feynman diagram. The dual of this triangulation is exactly that Feynman diagram, okay? Um, and uh, if I do something a little bit more complicated, let's say I have something like this, then uh, again, I would draw something like this, and the dual of this diagram um, is again uh, a Feynman diagram. Okay, so so Feynman diagrams, Feynman diagrams, are the duals of triangulations. Okay, and uh, and so that's uh, uh, and so um, and and so when I said you can't have crossing chords. Uh, that's, that's again, because only for the sort of planar uh, diagrams where the chords don't cross, is there a consistent dual Feynman diagram. Now, what would we do at one loop? So let's say I have a one loop diagram like this. Now, starting from the diagram, well, what does the dual diagram look like? The dual diagram would look something like this. And so I can think of the dual diagram uh, as, uh, as also a triangulation of a square, one, two, three, four, but now I have an extra point on the inside. So I, I would draw something like, like, like this, okay? So, so, uh, so this is again, dual to, I'll draw them with wiggly lines just so we can see them on top of each other. It's dual to this diagram, okay? Uh, I can draw another triangulation of the square. For, for example, I could do this, um, Okay, this is, uh, this is some other triangulation of the square. And this triangulation would correspond to something, uh, well, we, we, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to draw the uh, duals of all of, these, uh, all of these pictures, but everything that you can get, you can get things like this, you can get things like, um, uh, you can get things like this. Um, uh, uh, okay, so every possible diagram, every possible cubic diagram at one loop 
corresponds to some triangulation now of a surface with, uh, with, a, with a little hole in it. And the, the lines of the triangulation that go to the little hole uh, correspond exactly to the loop propagate. Okay, so in the simplest case, this triangulation only has this kind of, uh, this kind of arc. And that's the case where I just have the box. Um, the, the, more, uh, the, the more interesting ones have, uh, have a combination of sort of tree-like propagators and then ordinary uh, uh, loops in them uh, as well. Okay, so, so if I wanna think about now the physics at one loop, my, my analog of the space of X's would be the space of uh, curves that I could draw on the surface um, with, with also a little hole in the middle where I, I also allow myself to go, uh, I also allow to go uh, to hit that uh, hole, okay? So that's, that's the analog of the variables that we're talking about now. And so if I, if I proceed, uh, if, I, if I proceed in, in, in this way, um, uh, let me go back to where I was before here, okay? Um, Just, just so we have some, uh, uh, just so you have some uh, uh, understanding of what 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 we're talking about. So at one loop, we would have these kind of uh, pictures. So I've shown you some uh, some uh, pictures. There are some there are some little uh, interesting uh, detailed points. So for instance, I, I have this line. Uh, uh, I, now now because there's a hole in the middle, there's a distinction between this this uh, line that goes one way around the chord and this line that goes the other way. So I have both xij and xji. And it turns out that, that, that for some uh, uh, detailed differences, I, I don't have time to explain in um, uh, uh, more now, that, that you actually should think about two kinds of a uh, 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 variable that goes from the outside to the inside. Instead of just drawing a line that goes from the outside to the inside, you should secretly imagine that, that line is sort of spiraling around this hole in one direction uh, or the other. Okay, so that's that. That's a, that's a detail. But again, every one of the triangulations of this uh, of this picture now of, of four points with a puncture on with a little hole on the inside corresponds to some Feynman diagram. And here I've drawn in this case, this is the corresponding Feynman diagram, and this line corresponds to that particular uh, propagate. Um, this triangulation corresponds to this diagram that has a little tadpole in it. This triangulation corresponds to this diagram that has a little bubble in it, and so on. Okay, so so. All the Feynman diagrams are all the triangulations of the uh, surface. Um, and uh, so just like at tree level, uh, now it's, it's more interesting. We have more kinds of chord, we have more kinds of line. Um, and you can again ask, uh, that's my configuration space. In that space, I need to find a question and, uh, and somehow discover out of that question some shape uh, that uh, all the vertices are gonna magically be all the Feynman diagrams. But now instead of just having factorization where you put one of these uh, tree-like propagators uh, on shell, you also have to have the kind of uh, factorization where you can cut one of these loops. I can cut one of these loops open and reveal that I have two extra lines and have something at tree level, but with two extra particles. Okay, so those are the kinds of uh, singularities that we need to see in this one loop object. It's already much richer than it is at tree level. And remarkably, all of this comes out again by thinking about the wave equation. Okay, um, so we, we so we we do essentially exactly what 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 we did uh, uh, before. In fact, if I think about the the wave equation in one in one plus one dimensions, uh, the general solution. Uh, so I think about the uh, the uh, the wave equation is du dv x equals some source. I don't care about the source for now. But the solution of the wave equation is in general some function y plus of u and y minus of v. And so you have to imagine giving two degrees of freedom of initial data to uh, specify these uh, solution everywhere. And there's a number of natural ways of presenting this initial data. Um, one of them is to give the uh, data on, uh, on, let's say, two null surfaces, as uh, two null lines, as, as naively it looks like, because u and v are null directions. So I can give the data on y plus and on y minus. And if I give that data, I can fully specify x inside everywhere by this sort of Gauss's law formula, that X is at this point is given by Y plus here and Y minus there, plus the sum of all the charges that I get inside this uh, diamond. Okay, now, if I like, if I wanna only give the data on Y plus, then I can do that if I give another boundary condition elsewhere. So if I force that X equals zero on the surface, for example, then that determines Y minus in terms of Y plus. 
um, uh, because it enforces this condition that, that the X here is equal to Y plus plus Y minus plus the sum of all these charges here. So that gives me a relation between Y plus and Y minus. So if I fix X equals zero here, then if you just give me Y plus on the surface, then I can solve for uh, the wave equation everywhere on the uh, inside. Okay, so that's one way, one natural way of, of specifying the initial value problem for the wave equation. And as we've just seen, if we take that picture and we discretize it, we get uh, this polytope that has the property that, uh, it has, uh, uh, that, that the faces that are kept apart correspond to non-crossing cores, uh, and that it factorizes correctly on the uh, faces. Okay, so that was the sort of uh, uh, miracle we found in that example. Well, there's another natural way of specifying the wave equation, even more familiar, the kind of high school way of doing it, which is to give the initial data on a spatial surface. Okay, so if you give me the initial data on a spatial uh, uh, surface here, I can think about it as giving me uh, y plus and y minus now on this line, a sort of fold u and v. So they're just given by this uh, initial quote unquote time slice here. Um, and so again, I can solve for X everywhere inside if you give me this data. Once again, I can, if you give me, if you decide to enforce X equals zero somewhere else, then if you give me Y plus somewhere, then it totally determines Y minus on the other side. So again, just giving you, let's say the Y pluses is enough to solve for everyone everywhere. Okay, so it's a, so it's a very similar, uh, uh, it's just the other natural way of presenting the initial data for the wave equation. And if we take this picture and discretize it, remarkably what happens is you discover that all the variables that you see are in fact exactly uh, in bijection with, uh, are exactly related to the chords on that, uh, on, 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 on the picture of the disc with a hole in it. So if you just uh, write them all out, you again would have things like one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one, and so on. But as you follow them, you'd get one, three, one, four, but uh, instead of, uh, but, in, but this is for four points, you come back and one, one would now be interpreted as a loop, okay? So one, one is a loop. That's something that would be interpreted as a Feynman diagram as a tadpole propagator. And if you keep on going to the last, uh, 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 to the last layer here, the variable that you get here uh, would be associated exactly with those Ys, uh, with those variables that are the loop variables that go from the outside to the puncture. Okay, uh, to, to the hole in the middle. So I'm not explaining this in detail, but I'm, I'm just telling you that if you just look at, the, at this way of uh, looking at the uh, wave equation, just the variables that come to life are exactly the variables of the surface that's, uh, uh, that is relevant for one loop. Now you, you run exactly the same story. You write down the wave equation, you demand that all the constants are positive. Now you get a new polytope. And that new polytope remarkably does exactly what it's supposed to do. Okay, the facets of the polytope exactly capture what happens um, when a given propagator goes to zero. And what happens can either factorize into the product of two smaller objects, uh, a loop object, a one loop at one side and a tree on the other side, or it can turn into a tree, but with two extra particles. Okay, so, and, and those are the two things that from physics we know you have to do. Uh, but which just comes out of this very simple picture of the uh, of the wave equation with these positive um, uh, these positive uh, uh, these positivity conditions, and this is what the polytope looks like in the case of three-point scattering. And again, I won't go through it in the detail, but every facet of this polytope, all the vertices are associated with Feynman diagrams, one-loop diagrams for the phi cube theory with tadpoles and bubbles and everything um, uh, on the inside, and every facet correctly reflects one of the ways that uh, we can have uh, factorization. At the level, you can draw to the level of the factor diagrams, uh, at the level of the factorization of the amplitude, you can draw to the level of what happens to the surface when you cut along one of these curves and simplify the uh, surface um, into either the product of lower surfaces or another surface with uh, a disk with two extra points. And all of those uh, features are just are an immediate consequence of these um, uh, inequalities and this and this picture of positivity in this uh, kinematic space, um, and uh, I, I won't go through it uh, the rest of it in uh, detail. But uh, the uh, the claim is that this works to all loop orders, uh, to all orders in the one over n expansion, and uh, and in the language of surfaces, 
uh, we call these surfacedra, with every two-dimensional surface, with any number of boundary points, any genus, any number of uh, punctures, um, which corresponds to, uh, to, to the sum of all Feynman diagrams in some order of the one of Wren expansion, um, uh, there is a polytope associated with every such surface. And in general, there's lots of novelties associated with them beyond what I've told you about. Essentially, the story I've told you about is something we understood by the end of 2019. And really, our project in the pandemic has been to figure out how to extend this to the most general situation that involves many novelties that I've not uh, really had a uh, chance to talk about. The essential new novelty is that uh, when, when you start having complicated enough surfaces, you actually have infinitely many curves that you have to keep uh, track of. And so, uh, so that, 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 that you have to learn how to tame that, that infinity. And that's really what we've been uh, dealing with. But anyway, the bottom line is that with every surface, there's, there's a polytope. The polytope has a facet associated with every homotopy class of arcs that you can draw on the surface. In general, there's infinitely many of them. And so there's a fractal structure associated with these polytopes. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. But the faces capture all of the pinchings, possible pinchings of the surface, which in physics are capturing all the possible singularities and the correct factorization properties of, uh, of the integrand of the amplitude um, for them. And very interestingly, there's a class of, surf of, of curves that are crucial to the story that were not there to begin with in the Feynman diagrams, but which are actually there, they're necessarily there in part of the polytope, and they're associated with new singularities that we didn't think that we needed to think about to begin with, but which in a, in a rather precise sense can be thought of as, the, uh, as adding something like gravity to the story. So if all of this sounds a lot like things that you've run into in string theory, that if you only begin with open strings in string theory, then consistently forces you to have closed strings as well. We're seeing an avatar of all of that without any obvious strings in the game at all. So just in the, in the sort of very basic structural combinatorics of how the poles come together, uh, the fact that they're captured by these polytopes is a, is a remarkable fact that's true uh, for general surfaces. Um, but the, but the, the larger story also sees that you need, there's more going on than just the, the singularities that you thought you had. There's another kind of singularity that's associated with colorless particles, and it looks very much like the singularities that we associate with closed strings and gravity in uh, string theory. And so just so you have some idea what these things uh, look like, um, in, uh, here are just some pictures of what these uh, uh, surface edra look like. For the case of uh, tree level, uh, six point, uh, where you just have a disk with uh, uh, six points on the outside, that's a picture that we talked about already. I showed you what this picture looks like for one loop. Uh, three point is another three dimensional picture. I'm just showing you various uh, uh, pictures where the polytopes happen, happen to be three dimensional. If, the, um, if you have a, a, a sphere with three punctures, the corresponding Feynman diagrams that are being summed over are vacuum graphs that are two loop vacuum graphs that have this kind of topology. Okay, so this is another interesting three dimensional shape. Already, this is an interesting non planar shape. Okay, so this is an interesting shape, the annulus. The corresponding Feynman diagrams look like this. Um, uh, they're they're non-planar. They're they correspond to so-called double trace uh, corrections in in the uh, theory. And now now when you have an annulus, you can start having infinitely many uh, curves where you go from the outside to the inside, but you can wind around any number of times you like. So that's the infinity that I was talking about. And now you still get a three-dimensional polytope, but has a much more interesting shape. And you probably can't see in detail. But there's, a, but there's a kind of an in, infinite number of things that are getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And they asymptote to something. They asymptote to this interesting hexagon in the middle. And that hexagon in the middle is actually not one of the variables that we put in to begin with, but actually corresponds in a precise way, as I said, uh, to a something like gravity added to the uh, system. So you even see that. The, 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 the fact that uh, you'd have a hole without that is actually um, uh, is, uh, is very naturally seen in the uh, geometry. And as we go on, here's an example of vacuum non-planar graphs where this infinity becomes much more interesting and, uh, and, and you get these sort of fascinating three-dimensional polytopes with a highly fractal structure to their boundaries. If you take this picture and you project it down to two dimensions just for simplicity, it turns out that it, it, has, a, it has a facet um, uh, with a, uh, with whose normal it, uh, is every rational number P over Q in lowest terms. Okay, so, so there's, there's condensely many facets 
for every rational number p over q. And the way that happens is that it has a fractal structure. So that if you look at this polytope and you keep zooming in on it, zooming in on it, you notice smaller and smaller and smaller faces being shaved off in a very uh, interesting way. And all of this comes about uh, from some a simple analog of exactly the, this kind of, uh, uh, this analog of the wave equation picture uh, that I was telling you about, uh, appropriately generalized to the setting where you think about all of the curves on the surface in, in, a, uh, in, a, in, 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 in a correct way. Okay, so uh, I think um, uh, I've gone on a very long time. So I think uh, maybe this is another good place for me to uh, stop and ask if there are any questions. And we could probably just wrap up at this point um, or I could see if there's any questions and uh, if there's some interest, maybe I could just take five minutes to tell you something about um, uh, uh, how all of this, um, what the generalization, at least qualitatively, what the generalization of these ideas is that takes you from particles to a strings. But maybe this is a good place to stop and ask if there are any other questions. Yes. Is there a question? Uh, I there is, a, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question. So in the tree level case, there is some relation between the dimension of polytops and the uh, which point scattering amplitude. What about the loop case? There is some relation of the number of loop and yes, yes. Point. So, for example, at at at, uh, at tree level, uh, the the dimensionality of the polytope for endpoint scattering is n minus three. Mm -hmm. At one loop, the dimensionality is n. Okay, and there's a there's a general formula for for uh, it's not it's not just depending on loop, depending on loop order, depending on what order in the one over n expansion and so on. Okay, so um, but yes, there, there's a specific relation. It grows with n though. So as, as you go to higher end, the polytope lives in higher dimensions. So it means that you, you, it is also related to the cut that cut the loop and they make some tree level more, I mean. Yeah, so, 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 so for instance, indeed. So, so, so here is a, at the most basic level, uh, here, here's the connection, okay? So let's say we're talking about one loop. So I told you the one loop is uh, for N particles, the, the one loop is N dimensional, right? Mm -hmm. Now we know that one of the cuts, one of the cuts is taking an internal propagator and putting it on shell. So what that should look like is a tree amplitude, but with n plus two particles. You see, because I'm adding two. The guy that I cut, uh, I now uh, it's like I'm adding two extra particles to the process. The loop guides with equal and opposite momentum is like two extra particles, right? So now, so what is the dimensionality of an n plus two? dimensional polytope. Remember, for n points, it's n minus 3. So if I have n plus 2 points, it's n plus 2 minus 3, which is n minus 1. So, so it works. I had an n-dimensional polytope. I go to a face, which is n minus 1 dimensional. And n minus 1 is exactly equal to n plus 2 minus 3. <laughs> so it can match the correctly the dimensionality of, the, of, the, of that kind of um, uh, uh, cutting uh, uh, cutting an internal propagator singularity. And of course, all the rest of them work in exactly the same, same way. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then someone asked about the, uh, the branch cut. Um, uh, in, in this story so far, and, and, and you know, if I had uh, another hour or so, we would really get there. I've, I've been talking not about the full amplitude when I'm at loop level, I'm talking about the integrand of the amplitude. So you see, uh, I was drawing these Feynman diagrams, and I was associating, uh, I was associating with all the internal, with all the internal, uh, um, all the internal propagators, some variable with them. So, uh, so I'm talking about the integrand of the amplitude. They depend on some L, and so the integrand is this interesting, nice rational function. And then you still have to do the loop integral to get the uh, final answer. Okay. So, uh, so far. In this story, in this polytopal story, we're just talking about determining the integrand. We're not doing the loop integrals yet. And so we don't see uh, the branch cuts or anything like that. We still just have uh, rational functions. In the larger story, there's actually a concrete formula uh, associated with these geometries for the actual amplitude. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's very, that's, uh, um, that's uh, all, I mean, all of the stuff is, is the, the kind of, um, work in progress over the course of the pandemic. So none of it is in the, in the literature yet, 
but maybe I can just tell you when the uh, papers come out, uh, there will be a section, a big section where we talk about the actual amplitudes and how we get the actual amplitudes associated with these uh, geometries. Um, uh, maybe one, if I can give some, some flavor of it, um, uh, a, a flavor of it is that, uh, um, uh, yeah, I think I can't even give a, a, a flavor of it, unfortunately. Well, okay, a, 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 a flavor of it is if you're familiar in thinking in field theory with the Schwinger parametrization, um, then, uh, then, then, then you know that if, you, if we do a Schwinger parametrization of the uh, amplitudes, uh, if we do a Schwinger parametrization for a given diagram, we represent all the propagators in this very simple way where, where I take any, any given propagator and I, and I, um, uh, and I just uh, represent it in this uh, uh, exponential way. And this representation makes it trivial to do the loop integrals because we're just left with a Gaussian integral. Um, and then we have some integral of the Schwinger parameters left. Now, in this way of doing things, every diagram has its own private set of Schwinger parameters. And so we have to take all the diagrams, add them all up together, Schwinger parameterize each one, and then sum them all together. This picture of the polytope uh, and its corresponding so-called binary realization that's related to a strings, um, uh, but which doesn't need strings, you can also talk about without, without strings, it actually gives you a, a, a very interesting way of introducing Schwinger parameters, not for one graph at a time, but, but, uh, but one set of functions that sort of morph from the Schwinger parameters of one graph to another to another um, without enumerating all the graphs. A much simpler function, which has the property that it changes as you move around from, uh, from the Schwinger parameters of one graph to another to another, such that, uh, but you still get to, uh, take advantage of this to do the loop integrals and be left with a very simple integral where all the loop integrals are done and the integration is done essentially over these uh, polytopal geometries. So in the end, there is an expression for the actual amplitude. It has the flavor of the Schwinger representation, um, but it's a representation where all the diagrams are unified together in this uh, geometric way in one object uh, that actually gives you the actual amplitude. And from these representations, you can now start studying where the branch cuts come from, where a lot of the other things uh, uh, come from. And you can also actually even numerically get the amplitudes by pressing return on, on, on the computer in a, in a way that's, uh, that's uh, again, extremely efficient, vastly more efficient than, uh, than summing exponentially large number of, uh, of uh, uh, diagrams. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but this, this, this would take me a little longer to, uh, to uh, explain. Um, but what I was talking about in the talk so far was really uh, just the story of the integrand at tree level and at one loop. But I, the reason I went through this exercise at, at, at one loop is just to, to give you a flavor that this is not something very special. It only has to do with trees or with classical physics or something like that. It's a very general thing. It's there at tree level at one loop, actually at any loop order, at any order in the one around expansion. Um, and um, uh, and uh, it's a very structural fact about uh, locality and and uh, and uh, unitarity and the way that it's it uh, it's captured by these interesting positive geometric structures. Okay, but I think I've gone on really a, a long time and probably the best thing to do. Uh, maybe we can uh, uh, stop now and we can clap. Um, yeah, but before uh, clap, there is a yeah, couple right. more questions. Sorry. Okay, good. There, 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 one there, one, uh, one yeah, question yeah. in the chat window and another question from the audience. So okay. please, could you could you take a look at the which yeah, question I in the chat window? I, I, I answered you the, answer the question that? in the okay. in, in in the chat window, which was about okay. the branch good. chat. Yeah. So what what, uh, what was the other question? And another question from someone, please. No. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the uh, nice lecture. Uh, so I, I guess uh, spin sum and color flow might be additional factors. Could you comment on them, how we treat them? Yeah, so, so, so color is really, uh, is really uh, the kind of uh, uh, an important star of this show because really the kind of existence of surfaces really begins with color here. Okay, so it's really the fact we have N by N matrices and the usual Tuftian picture that uh, that the relates uh, uh, relates the sort of uh, uh, large n physics of it doesn't have to be at large n, but we do a, we do the 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 uh, trace expansion and the genus expansion that has to do with uh, with color. So in a sense, uh, 
um, I could start the entire story by just saying, let's go all the way back to taking n by n scalars um, and just, uh, and we have just, just where does the surface come from? It just comes from the fact that if I draw one of these, if I draw one of the Feynman diagrams, double line notation, and that defines a triangulation of a surface. So whether I like it or not, there's, there's a surface there. Um, and then you can just really begin by there, from there on the entire story flows from that, from that point. Uh, I was describing these things, as I said, little snapshots of kind of simple parts that are easy to uh, explain in an hour each. But the systematic story is really that there's a, there's a zeroth order existence of a surface that begins with the fact that we have color and the entire story just develops inevitably from that uh, point. So color flow is absolutely central. And so if you wanna know what kind, is there a positive geometry for something completely uncolored that is actually a big challenge. We don't know how to get a positive geometry yet for something completely uncolored. Let me give you a very simple version of this question. Suppose I want to understand just phi cube theory, not trace phi cube, but literally phi cube, just one stupid scalar, right? Well, what is the amplitude at four points? It would be like one over S plus one over T plus one over U, right? There'll be three terms. Well, there's only one pole, so if I want to think of it as a geometry, surely it should be a one-dimensional space because I only have one, one pole each. But usually I have a real problem. What kind of one-dimensional geometry has three boundaries? <laughs> it has to have three singularities at S, T, and U equals zero, right? So we don't really know how to think about completely uncolored uh, uh, physics uh, in this kind of geometric way. And this is not actually very different than the, the, the challenges that people have in string theory. Because in, in, in string theory, really closed string amplitudes are really are derivatives of open string ones. You take sort of copies of open string amplitudes together to get closed string amplitudes. But the kind of completely intrinsic definition of closed string amplitudes by themselves is not, uh, is not really the sort of most natural thing. Um, so, uh, so whether this means that there's uh, that uh, that the geometric picture for things that are intrinsically uncolored or closed or gravitational is not there, or that it involves some really new ideas we don't yet know. Um, but uh, anyway, this is a long answer to your question that color is playing a very crucial role. The next question is spin. And in fact, uh, you know, the, 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 the very earliest version of these kind of uh, geometric structures associated with amplitudes was the story of the so-called amplitohedron. And that's for the theory of gluons. So it's for gauge theories of gluons. Very naively, you would think the gauge theory amplitudes are much more complicated than scalar amplitudes, but that's one of the amazing things about this whole subject that it's all backwards, right? Is that the gluon amplitudes are shockingly simple. Um, and that's one of many indications that there's something wrong with the standard Lagrangian way of thinking about things is that it fools you into thinking that the, that the gauge amplitudes are complicated and scalar amplitudes are simple, but it's actually the other way around, okay? Um, uh, and there, uh, it's really the, the sort of helicity really matters, okay? Um, and uh, and uh, there's a feature that uh, Yang-Mills amplitudes have that just these scalar amplitudes do not have, that Yang-Mills amplitudes, in addition to having factorization singularities, um, like every theory does, just like this phi cube theory does, they also have soft singularities. Soft singularities are not something that we have without polarizations, without spin. There's something very important that the spin and helicity are very important for those. And it turns out that, that just like the geometry, just like remarkably, if I look at all the pole structure for the uh, associated with factorization, it's, it's captured by this polytope. That's the sort of substance of my uh, talks, right? Um, what we discovered earlier is that not just the pole structure associated with factorization, but also all the soft limits, all the pole structures in yang mills theory are captured by a vastly richer object, that's the amplitohedron. Okay, so, so uh, there's part of the story of the amplitohedron that's only about maximally supersymmetric theories. That's if you want to use it to completely determine the amplitudes, but there's something very general about it that's true even for QCD, that the long distance singularities are captured by this much fancier geometry, okay? So the role of helicity is really huge in changing the nature of the geometry from being these relatively simple polytopes that I've been talking about to these much fancier, uh, actually much simpler, but deeper, vastly deeper and richer objects associated with the uh, uh, amplitohedron. It's just a weird accident of history that we ran into the more fancy object first 
And then we discovered the, uh, the uh, simpler structure uh, later. Um, and, uh, but the simpler structure has the advantage that we can do with it something that we do not yet know how to do with the amphitohedron, which is to define it beyond the planar limit, no supersymmetry. These are completely general things. There's nothing to do with large n, you know, in any order in the one around expansion, nothing to do with Susie, nothing to do with uh, planarity. So, it, and, and we can take the program right to the very end and actually get the literal amplitudes out of it rather than just the integrands. So that's why we decided to sort of focus our, our attention over the past number of years to trying to completely nail this simpler story because the, the, the geometric uh, aspect is simpler so that you can really nail it to the wall. And uh, now that it's more or less understood, uh, I think that's big motivation to go back and think about the story, including helicity now, go back to the amphitohedron and try to see whether we can see an al analogs of these kind of structures that we've seen for the more uh, interesting case. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Can I ask you one? Sure, Youngdo, yes. Yeah, uh, a few years ago, I mean, you emphasized the importance of this helicity for gay theory and Suji. Yes, uh, yes. That's why this uh, approach is really uh, competitive yes. compared to standard QFT. Right. And now you come up with the scalar cubic theory. Yes. And yes. still, there is something also you can get. Yes, indeed. So I, I was I was wrong. I mean, I was wrong in thinking that uh, that that uh, the, the only thing that was going on had something to do with helicity. There's even something interesting going on without helicity. Yeah, but I, I I think I asked it uh, yesterday. So you you believe that for every uh, uh, scattering amplitude there is a geometry or the space time that you can build this way or. I, I just, uh, uh, can you, I mean, can you I, just I mean, share uh, your vision on why this program is so promising? I mean, I, I, I just did find some example. I mean, it's, it's uh, mathematically interesting, but looks like a toy example. And I don't see why all uh, amplitude that we are dealing with should have this structure. So, well, I mean, you, you, so, should... I mean, you, you can, of course, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, when, uh, the, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the completely honest truth is, of course, we don't know, right? You know, so we're just exploring to uh, we're exploring to a C. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, that that the aspects it's not like it's not like like it's sort of toy things uh, that are that are being captured. There are universal aspects of amplitudes for any theory that are captured by these objects. So any theory in the world, all of the possible poles that it can have. Are the ones that we're talking about that are captured by these uh, uh, by these associhedra and their uh, generalizations, whether it's phi to the fourth, phi to the fifth, Kyle Lagrangian gravity, Yang Mills, the only singularities uh, uh, that all these uh, factorization singularities are universal. Sometimes you can have numerators that remove some of them. Okay, but all the possible uh, singularities they can have are in this list. This list is about sort of locality and unitarity at the coarsest level. Um, and, uh, and so the fact that that's captured by this completely autonomous object is, um, uh, is, uh, is, is the encouragement to keep going. Um, as I was saying, there's something analogous in Yang Mills, there's even more. In Yang Mills, there's soft singularities that are also universal. And if you include the soft singularities, then the kind of structure associated with it is much richer. It's not captured by, by polytope. And that's a story of the amphitohedron. Okay, so the, the amphitohedron is something about the, with something even more universal when you have Yang Mills. But all of the geometry that I talked about today is somehow contained inside the amphitohedron uh, because uh, that's a subset of all the singularities that we should see um, uh, uh, it, uh, that are captured there already. Even how to see that connection between these things is something that's just being developed and explored now. But what I'm trying to tell you is that there's an aspect of this physics, which is long distance, poles, factorization, singularities, long distance singularities, that's totally universal, that's associated in the surprising way with the, with the, uh, with the uh, geometry. Now, um, uh, in some theories, like the phi cube theory or Yang Mills and, in, uh, and uh, uh, some other number of examples, um, when the when the entire, in other words, when the only interaction you have is a cubic interaction, then and the cubic interactions are completely determined by symmetries. They're totally determined by uh, Poincaré invariants. Okay, then it's reasonable that if those are the only interactions, then if you know something about the singularities, you know the whole thing. Okay, um, 
if you have something beyond cubic interactions, then you clearly need to know more. And that's what I was saying in the, in the answer to the, uh, uh, when this question, an analog of this question was raised halfway through my talk today, is that when we have other theories, other interactions, um, they're associated with other kinds of singularities, not just in the IR, but in the UV, okay? And so that's the kind of program uh, is, is to now see, uh, once we start getting all these, all the, all the sort of long distance uh, stuff nailed, um, how should we think about the UV stuff associated with more general interesting uh, numerator structures? But just to give you uh, an idea, already with the kind of things that I'm telling you about uh, today, I didn't have a chance to tell you about the sort of uh, stringy version of these things, but already the kind of uh, uh, stringy version of these things tells you how to do an analog of all these things, not just for phi cube theory, but for phi cube, phi to the four, any polynomial interactions, anything uh, uh, you like. Um, so uh, do I still have you guys or am I disconnected? Oh, you guys are back? Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes I yes. can hear you. Okay, right. Yeah, sorry, I, I think I just uh, disconnected for a second. So what I was saying, Hyung Do, is that uh, we, we already know how to do analogs of these things, not just for phi cube, but for any polynomial interactions of phi, for example, okay? Um, uh, so we know how to put in the information for any polynomial uh, interactions in phi. And in a very precise sense, instead of looking for objects that have poles in a particular spot, you have to look and which factorize properly. You have to look for polynomials, which factorize correctly. Instead of things with poles, you look for things that are polynomials that factorize correctly. And there's some geometry associated with them as well. So it's not just phi cubed, it's phi cubed plus any set of polynomial uh, interactions. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that that's uh, uh, all, all I can say is that it's, uh, it's a work in the progress. Um, uh, and, and we don't know and we, and we, we and, so it could be that it, it could be that you're right. It could be you're right that these are just uh, red herrings, that uh, they're just exceptional things for a, a few theories here or there. Um, all I can tell you is that none of these structures were like lying around on the surface. None of these things are sort of totally obvious that, that they were there. We went looking for them because we had the sort of vision that, that something like this should exist. And we went digging and we found them. <laughs> Uh, and there's absolutely no reason for them to exist. We certainly didn't invent them. There's, these are most certainly not invented by the, by the human imagination. They're out there. They're out there in the sort of platonic world of ideas that, that connect physics and mathematics in some, uh, appears to me, very deep way. Uh, and, um, uh, and so they had absolutely no reason to exist. Uh, other than, as far as I'm concerned, they only exist because they're part of some vast structure that, uh, that uh, tells us how to think about physics in a totally different way. Um, that's the only reason I can imagine why they exist. Otherwise, as strange isolated things, it's just too strange for things that are so, so sort of perfect and so, uh, on, on the other hand, sort of alien and strange, there's absolutely no reason for them to randomly exist. They're certainly not invented by uh, humans, and the only reason I can imagine that they exist is that they're really reflecting this other way of thinking about things. And as I say, there are strange connections between them as well. I mean, it's one of those things where the objects we study know vastly more about what's going on than uh, we do. And uh, maybe a final comment is that, uh, you know, if I go back to the case of the amphitohedron, um, uh, at the leading order of tree approximation, it literally describes gluon scattering in the real world. This is not some toy model that's infinitely far away from, it's literally the real world. <laughs> okay, so uh, as toy models go, it's closer to the real world than almost any other toy model that I know of. So this is some kind of structure that is directly connected to physics in the real world. And um, uh, uh, even in, in, in all details uh, at leading approximation, and various aspects of it are, are capturing universal aspects of all theories that we know of in the uh, uh, re real world. Anyway, that's all polemics. You could read yeah. the you could read the tea leaves any way you want. That not only very special theories, uh, or it's a hope that a lot more will come out. It's not very invariant. Uh, those of us who work on it obviously work on it with the hope that it's going to connect to a, something grander. Um, it might happen. It might not happen. But um, uh, but. Um, uh, anyway, it's something, it's some sort of honest work that we can try and do, and that's what we are trying to uh, do.
Okay, uh, I think it's almost two hours have passed and uh, I think it's time to thank uh, Nima for his excellent lectures with the full of energy and uh, inspiration. Uh, and if you have, have more questions, we, one can contact him, I think. Sure, and yeah, absolutely. Then, uh, so let's give him a big hand. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate yeah. it. I enjoyed it. So yeah, thank now. you very much. Thank you very thank much you. for your inspiring lectures. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Please, please visit Kias someday. I most certainly will. I most certainly okay. will. When, when life goes back to normal, I, I most certainly will. Thank you so thank much, you. guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.